Okay, yeah, so as Hassan mentioned, tonight's a special kind of uh, double header, if you will, um, where we get to now have the pleasure of learning more about the work of one of our panelists. <coughs> so Rahul Mehrotra is a practicing architect, an urban designer, and an educator, underlining all of those. Um, he founded our... Here, here, here. Sorry. We're good. I'm going down. <laughs> <laughs> he founded uh, his office, RMA Architects, in 1990, um, <clears throat> and that's a that's based in Mumbai and Boston. Um, and he's designed a wide range of projects, really, from the scale of private homes to government and private institutions, and then a collection of projects driven, I'd say, by the office's commitment to advocacy. And so it's really interesting to hear. Um, the frame that he's putting around Charles Correa's work around agency. Um, the work of the office is really highly contextual uh, in the deeper sense of context, uh, embracing the particular opportunities, I'd say, of climate, culture, and place. Um, we see frequent use of local materials and methods that empower local craftspeople, uh, incorporation of passive cooling strategies like wind towers uh, or natural ventilation through courtyards, um, and they're forward-looking ideas too, you know, that are slightly more high-tech, like living facades, uh, which use plant life as a dynamic facade element for shading, but also cooling the building, incorporating ev evaporation with the irrigation systems. Um, the engagement with context, though, also spans into conservation. So um, he's recently done a master plan for the Taj Mahal, for instance. Um, but there's also great humility in contexts where resources can be limited. Um, for instance, uh, there's a social housing project for 100 elephants and their caretakers. Um, that's in Jaipur. And throughout, I'd say, a sense of, thanks, that's actually for you. Um, a sense of poetry really permeates the work um, with ideas like celebrating the connection between Earth and Sky, which we see in the Sydney Modern Art Gallery competition. Um, in 2018, RMA Architects were awarded the Venice uh, Architecture Biennale's jury special mention for, quote, three projects that address issues of intimacy, empathy, uh, and empathy, gently diffusing social boundaries and hierarchies. I thought that really nicely uh, put a circle around the work. So that's just the practice. Um, but Rahul is also prolific in the academy. Um, he studied at the architecture, uh, School of Architecture Ahmedabad, where he received the gold medal for his undergraduate thesis uh, and graduated also with a master's degree with distinction in urban design from Harvard University. Um, he's taught at the University of Michigan at the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT, and he's currently professor of urban design and planning at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, where he recently served as chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design. <coughs> He's also director of the Master of Landscape Architecture and Urban Design degree program and co-director of the Master of Landscape Architecture and Urban Design degree program. Um, so he's written extensively um, and lectured extensively on topics of architecture, conservation, and urban planning, um, especially in design in Mumbai and India. So I'll just list some of the writings and you get a flavor of the topics. Um, Bombay, the cities within, which is covering the city's urban history from the 1600s to the present. Anchoring a city line, a history of the city's commuter railway. Uh, and Bombay to Mumbai, changing perspectives. That one sort of explains itself. He co-authored Conserving an Image, the Fort Precinct in Bombay, um, as a result of which uh, the Fort Precinct in Mumbai was declared a conservation precinct in 1995. Uh, a first such designation in India. Again, agency. In 2000, he edited The Architecture of the 20th Century in the South Asian region, quite encompassing. You're marking the end of the last century. In uh, 2014, oh sorry, 2011, he wrote Architecture in India. Sorry, the list is just amazing. Uh, the Architecture of the 20th Century, sorry, Architecture in India since 1990, on contemporary architecture in India. Um, and that work has extended into exhibitions as well. Um, in 2014, he published the Kumela, 
mapping the ephemeral megacity, which is a university-wide research project. Um, and actually, we passed a, a student thesis project on a similar topic, on the same topic, uh, in the corridor here. Um, his latest co-authored book uh, is titled Taj Mahal Multiple Narratives, uh, which is also published in 2017. Um, but his research on urbanism uh, is largely focused on evolving a theoretical flame framework for designing conditions of informal growth, what he refers to as the kinetic city. Uh, many of his design studios have focused on this area of interest, um, and this topic is, is what his current research looks at, um, which is expected to be um, published later this year. Uh, outside of practice, just to wrap up, I've said enough. Outside of practice, he's teaching uh, and teaching. Rahul has been involved in civic and urban affairs in Mumbai, having served on government commissions for the conservation of historic buildings and environmental issues uh, with various neighborhood groups as executive director of the Urban Design Research Institute uh, in Mumbai. So again, I think I've said enough here. Please join me in welcoming Rahul. So thanks, thanks Nate, and thanks Hassan, Stephen, and thanks for being patient. We've been trying to organize this for a year now, and many apologies, and very glad to be here. So thanks again. So what I'm going to sort of do is, you know, share with you some projects, and hopefully through that extract some issues which are rather specific to India, but I think also something that we should all be thinking about uh, as architects and sort of going back to this question of agency of design, I thought it's interesting. So, you know, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, and you know, here, I, I think a lot of these observations come out of teaching and many things that sort of Nate alluded to, which I'm not going to talk about, which is the writing, exhibitions, and that kind of feedback loop made one think about many of these issues also in the context of one's own work. And so this idea of, you know, the sphere of concern and the sphere of influence, I think this is something I believe we all struggle with because our sphere of concern is all the way from climate change to inequity and poverty and we can speak about all of this and we wake up the next morning and we don't know what we can do about any of this. And so how do we begin to map and intersect our spheres of concern with our spheres of influence? And I think this is a, a big challenge uh, for uh, architects. And I think one way we can do this is really, you know, we talk about the practice of architecture, but what is the architecture? architecture of practice, uh, what is the, the form or what are the models by which we can engage with the world, I think we need to deeply reflect about because I think there's a lot of redundancy in the way we perhaps even teach this. There's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of implicit uh, message in, uh, in our teaching of architecture which brings it down to very narrow one or two possible ways of doing it. And we of course go out in the world, and that's what a good education does, is it equips us to go out in the world and then discover the other ways of engaging with the world in models. And I think that's fine, but maybe I think we could begin to, as pedagogues and academics, reflect about what might be the other models by which we could engage with the world. And I think here the spheres of concern and spheres of influence can begin to create some sort of intersections. And the third observation I want to kind of, which has been more recent for me just through my experiences, and I, I want to preface showing you the work with just these three observations is, I think related to the sphere of influence and concern, sphere uh, related to the idea of models of practice, is also our understanding of the client. Uh, we see the client as a very unified entity. But I've begun to think through my own reflections that actually the client is a patron client, an operational client, and a user client, and these are differentiated. And you know, for example, in a in a in a university, you have a university building committee. Uh, then you have the president of the university. The president might have influence often on choosing the architect or the nature of building or bringing a donor in. So the president becomes a kind of patron in a way. The operational clients are, you know, the the engineering or the the, the building 
you know, whatever, the building committee or, you know, who have a whole different set of aspirations from the patron. And then you have the users, which would be the students, faculty, etc., who also bear upon these decisions. These are completely disparate entities with completely different aspirations often. And as architects, we get often trapped in one of those spheres. So we either are overly sensitive to the user and then struggle with the operational client most often we get consumed by the operation client who calls the shot and we take them at face value as the client, often because we don't have the ability to go across these circuits. So some architects aren't good at connecting with students and faculty and feel shielded within the building office uh, as their clients. And some come right through the president as the patron and then can't attach themselves to the other two in terms of feedback loops. And so I think in practice, to recognize and differentiate these become really critical. And I think our ability that we must cultivate through our education, but through our operation, is how we can move horizontally, slide through this, and have a much broader imagination of what the client will be. And of course, the most important of all these clients is the planet Earth. Now, in some cases, the client actually collapses into one entity. <laughs> and a weekend home or a single family house is the classic example where it might be partners that you have to sometimes negotiate some differences between, but you know it's minor compared to say building for a university or then building for the government in a country like India where it's even more disparate. And I'm gonna show you a series of projects really to share with you the projects, but I just want you to keep these lenses in mind because each one of these have a completely differentiated dynamic in terms of what the client means and what the client could potentially mean. And I believe that some of these were successful painfully often because we began to intuitively recognize this and work across uh, these different differentiated aspirations. So the first project, I'm gonna start with a house where these things collapse. In Mumbai, the metropolitan area, young architects always start by doing weekend homes uh, and small projects like that. That's sort of the route that you cultivate your practice. Uh, this is interesting. This is the kind of stuff that gets built there. I always tell this sort of story, you know, where here you have the Palladian Villa or the classic kind of uh, example of, of an object in the landscape where the symmetry of the building probably comes from its exteriors, as you see in that diagram up there. But in the traditional sort of uh, fabric, uh, it would be the other way. The kind of uh, the, the symmetry really comes from the courtyard, uh, which is, uh, you know, the center of the house. The house might be asymmetric on the outside. So in different traditions, this is differentiated. And this is the kind of house that gets built in the peripheries of Mumbai for weekends. And, you know, I was on the boat going to this sort of uh, area with a contractor who was boasting about how he was designing this house. It's for a really well-known pop star. And I said, who's the architect? And he said, no, no, there's no architect. I'm building it. She gave me a postcard of the White House in Washington and asked me to copy it. And what this does is architecture becomes an instrument where you polarize society because this, these are comparatively impoverished, not as wealthy peripheries as the city itself. They're rural landscapes and the elite build weekend homes for indulgence here. And then you have houses like this which have nothing to do with the environment. You have compound walls, beware of dog signs. If you go down the driveway, you feel you're on a landing strip in an airport because there are bollards every two feet. You know, so it's, it's completely out of sync. And therefore you create very hard thresholds because you have to buffer yourself in isolation from actually the reality of the countryside around. And here you really are reminded that the instrumentality of architecture to either separate people or bring people together is a critical part of our empowerment in a sense, uh, and we can use it either way. And so this was one of the early houses we did in this area called Alibag. It was for a young couple where what we essentially did was in talking to them, we realized that in the year they're going to spend about 60 days at the most, which is maybe six weekends or 10 weekends or, you know, whatever. And so what here, the living room is that porch and the living room also becomes a gesture to the community. So the caretaker in this case can actually use that space when people are not there to entertain his friends, to sit with his own family, uh, you know, etc. 
And so you begin to get a softening of the threshold. So what they, they do, the couple does, is all that light furniture is put into the house, and that becomes an offering to the countryside, to the caretaker, to people who actually engage with the house in terms of their services. And of course, we've sort of detailed it, and it's not a matter of just making these gestures, but also articulating the building. Uh, and that's what it sort of looks like. The roof collects the rainwater. You see the two taps there. Because there's surplus water, the taps are accessible to the villagers who can come and extract the water because the couple doesn't need that much water for the few days that they spend there. And so for me, this was about what I would call softening thresholds, where you begin to use architecture in a way that becomes more porous. It allows this kind of movement. Now, even if it's a gesture, I think it's important. And a follow-up project, uh, which you see at the bottom of the screen, which is on the periphery of the village, with the village beginning to encompass it, is for a doctor, a very famous young doctor who discovered uh, drug-resistant TB. And so he had more money than he needed and wanted to build a mansion and asked us to almost, get, short of giving us that postcard of the White House, I mean, that's how he described what he'd want as a villa. And, and I think in our arguments, we talked to him about imagining that village grows around you. How would this feel integrated within the village? And of course, then the first sort of thing we had to do was to disaggregate it. Uh, and so the house was broken up into chunks. For us, it was also an experiment to imagine how the same ideas as a research agenda would work for a middle class family where if someone had to had to invest incrementally, and here I think the inspiration of architects like Charles Courier very important, how would that happen? And so what you see on the top there is the living, dining, and a kitchen, and then you have a, a, the, a, a lap pool with a doctor's study and a guest room, and then you have a separate block, which is three bedrooms where the family can go. So if the family is together, they can actually use it as one big room on a weekend and bond and all of that. If they take other guests from whom they want privacy, those rooms can be closed off. And that's kind of a study model that shows you. And this is how it sort of feels uh, when you sort of drive up to it, when you see it from the village. It's fragmented enough that when the village grows around it, the skyline will hopefully just merge. Of course, it will always be distinct, but in terms of scale, uh, it would uh, absolutely uh, merge. And the swimming pool is not in the garden and it's not exposed because, again, these are important decisions because here you have gardeners who are often poor, who are working in the garden, and then you have these kinds of hedonistic practices of pools with beach umbrellas. It's kind of out of sync. So the pool here is an exercise pool which is integrated within the house. It's discreet so that you don't begin to create these visual polarities also in terms of functions, uh, etc. And it's, it's a series of courtyards. You see the water body there. And uh, it's a very simple materials in terms of scale. That was the living room. This is how the pool is sort of integrated uh, within the space. So it becomes a feature, but it also becomes uh, very usable from the study. Uh, and it's discreet, but yet frames the outside. So it blurs the inside and the outside visually. And this is the bedroom area where they are very you know, blinds are very discreetly tucked away. You can bring them down and actually, it's very Japanese in its inspiration that it can separate the rooms for total privacy, but it can also very generously open out into like a three bedroom suite if the family and the extended family, the kids, uh, etc., cetera, are around because this is after all a weekend home. Uh, and then it's sort of designed for different climates. It's designed for the monsoon in the way it kind of, the same elements begin to respond to collecting water, but making it also usable in the monsoon, uh, which is a very extreme form of climate uh, in, a, in a region such as this. Uh, and the details are subtle, so copper is just used as a flashing, but also made ornament for the windows. But otherwise, the materials are all very local uh, and, 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 and rather simple, uh, which when there's very little art, and it's these colored glazing that sort of change light in the room and therefore make you aware of the time of the day, uh, etc. And then again, the way it sort of blurs in and out uh, of the, uh, from, the, from the outside to the landscape and the inside, etc. The second project is, is more complicated, and this is Hyderabad, which is where Hassan's family, I think, or you have connections there. Uh, it's in the southern part of India, and this was the Nizam. The Nizam of Hyderabad was at one point the wealthiest man on the planet, uh, and he had a series of palaces which went into disrepair after independence when uh, you know they lost their power on these sort of properties. Uh, and we got involved in this in 2000. 
uh, in a very decrepit state and there you see the Char Minar which is a well known monument, you see the four towers uh, and the city had sort of encroached upon this and our project was to stabilize this as a public space uh, and the Nizam's wife came back to India, she lives in Turkey, to reclaim this property but to create them as assets for the public. And this was complicated because here your client or your patron now was the Nizam's wife who had these intentions. Uh, the most important player in this was a lawyer who was part of the patron sort of group. Uh, the users we had to imagine because it was going to be the city in the future uh, and the operational clients were craftspeople, they were again lawyers who were helping us reclaim the land. So it was a decade long project uh, which resulted in the creation of public space for the city. Uh, what you see in red is all the property that had been encroached upon which we couldn't reclaim but we had to stabilize the edges so that the central courtyards, the three courtyards, you can look at the density of the city and so it becomes actually an asset because it becomes a public park. So is it a conservation project? Of course it is a historic preservation project because it's an important piece of you know, uh, heritage but it's also a public uh, interest uh, project, it is a public space project, it's a landscape project, it's a planning project because land rights had to be negotiated, working with these lawyers, etc., to make sure where we were investing the money was property that wasn't encroached, that really belonged to the Nizam, etc. That's how we sort of, when we walked into the property, that's the shape it was in sort of Angkor Wat like uh, parts had sort of just gone into complete disrepair. So it was a matter of actually documenting it. We created a portfolio of about 120 uh, drawings which were measured because these drawings didn't exist and uh, and so this mapping of defects and so this we spent about two years just doing this because we couldn't embark, embark on an uh, ambitious project like this without having very very good documentation. And then of course there were many learnings, so you see these beautiful arches. Actually, it's a post and beam granite uh, structure, and everything else is decorative, decoration, which is built in lime. Uh, and the lime takes months to sort of uh, build because you have to let it, uh, you know, you, you do it in layers and you mold it, and there you see craftspeople. And luckily in India, these traditions are living, and so it is a matter of actually challenging what I was describing as models of practice because here instructions weren't tender documents. Instructions were creating a rapport with craftspeople who often didn't even speak English or couldn't read uh, and then working with them on site, living there for periods of time to gain their confidence, uh, to learn from them because they would tell you how it could be done the best given the kind of quality of lime, the, given the state of the stone that was the substructure. And so it's, it's really interesting because I think for those of us who are doing historic preservation and contemporary buildings, I believe they are part of the same activity. We have siloed them both in the academy but also in practice. People specialize in historic preservation because I think contemporary architects have a lot to learn about weathering, for example, material life cycles. In conservation projects, you very quickly realize that all the problems lie at the junction between two materials that have two completely different life cycles because one decays before the other. And so I think these are lessons I believe we have really embedded in our contemporary projects. Um, and you know, I can point some of these out as we go along, but for me, it's become a complete blur. And I think this is something, again, within the academy, we have to promote much more because there are deep learnings from historic preservation for contemporary buildings, which don't seem so evident. And I think weathering is one great example. And that's sort of the finished product. Uh, that's the main Kilwat Mahal, which is the real palace where the Darbar occurs. Those chandeliers were put together. We identified the grandchildren of the people who had originally assembled them because of the records in the Nizam sort of archives. And they came back and they knew exactly what to do with these chandeliers which had been put in, away in, in boxes. That entire ceiling that you see in this Kilwat Mahal was built afresh. Uh, luckily, again, we have these crafts. They were fragments from which we could actually reconstruct it. And a whole host of details uh, which take you to a completely different granular sensibility uh, when you're looking at it. And the budgets were constrained, so this is not a fancy air-conditioned gallery. It's very loosely organized from the Nizam's archives uh, just to give people an insight into their family, their life, what they did. 
Uh, this is the beautiful textile. So here we made an intervention by putting glass. You see the spider clamps. They're not visible from the outside anywhere. So it's very minimal in terms of how the new touches the old. Uh, and these sort of create these uh, museum spaces because some of these are very rare textiles that also needs minimal climate control and humidity uh, control. So this was a project that we did and this took us into another much broader project. In fact, they were happening simultaneously because in post-colonial conditions, this conservation actually becomes very complicated because when the custodians of an environment are di a different culture from the creators of the environment, that's what post-colonialism is. It's very complicated because whose narrative are you using and whose narrative are you reinforcing? So here now the custodians are the Indians, which is a completely different culture from the British. So when we use British narratives of English heritage, which comes out of the narratives and the culture of the creators, there's a dyssynchrony in the location. And so how do you construct significance while keeping the illusion of architecture intact? This becomes a complicated and a really interesting question. And here we zoomed out and created this legislation to declare the whole fort, the historic district of Mumbai uh, conservation zone. And here the patrons, we were the patrons because we were self-initiating this. The clients were people we put together as citizens associations uh, and the users were the citizens at large. Uh, and so, you know, the historic city, its present state, how do you begin to create a new significance for it? How do you, how do you, how do you identify the contemporary engine that might drive the process of conservation? And we began to identify different districts that had consistent aspirations. So what you see in yellow is a banking district, uh, you know, the tourist district. What you see in, in 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 the pink up there is the corporate district. And we began to organize different citizens groups. And this is a lecture in itself, but I'll give you a glimpse of what we did in the art district, which is what you see between the yellow and the red where they it was never an art district historically but we found there were 15 galleries that were occurring over time there automatically and it had wonderful public space so we began branding it as an art district we constructed a new significance recognizing that would be the contemporary engine that could potentially drive the process of conservation and we organized as activist citizens groups we began to develop a narrative we organized a festival uh, we began signposting the place so that in people's imagination they had a new kind of imaginary of what the area could potentially be started organizing uh, concerts in the open, lighting up buildings, using interstitial spaces for children's activities in this case, uh, convincing uh, uh, building owners to allow their facades to be used as pavement galleries, uh, organizing concerts in the public space to raise money, pavement galleries, uh, using that money then to repair the public space because this is very low in the priorities of the government who's dealing with many other kinds of uh, you know immediate problems but this was done through raising money privately through the organizing of festival actually restoring buildings creating tripartite arrangements in this case between the state government the education secretary and the association of the art district uh, to restore these grade one buildings so this was we were being the clients and the patrons here as the association Association that raised the money and appointing architects. It was wonderful because very early on in my career, I was actually appointing a conservation architects. And so that's all. These are the experiences that made me see the production of the built environment from different perspectives and realizing that it's the rapport between this deconstructed, more complex form of what you imagine clients to be that could be very productive in the way we could engage as architects in creating these circuits and feedback loops of decision making. So here too, it was about documentation. Here is the Prince of Wales Museum. And here we kind of uh, did an annex for them, which was actually uh, a warehouse which had no openings except one hoist here and one door. And this was a light well. Uh, and we added a veranda here to create circulation systems. So opening up 50,000 square feet of, uh, of space for this art district. So it was also about architectural interventions because as we understood and imagined the art district, we knew, we knew what kind of responses we needed architecturally. So you actually then create your own agency in a sense. That is, you define the context within which you might intervene because then you're very clear about how you're going to intervene. And then, of course, it's a matter of getting people to imagine these projects. 
and that's the new intervention so done with contemporary sort of sensibilities it's all done a foot away from the old building so it's reversible so it also meets the canons of historic preservation it can be dismantled very easily if another generation believes that an intervention like this in a historic fabric is not the right way to go and then later we at the bottom there you see that curved oval shape we added a visitor center and now we adding we just added a children's pavilion which opened last week many small interventions contemporary interventions within this historic grade one precinct but all with the way that they were contemporary they kind of set up a new dialogue with the historic grade one building and they're all reversible so this one it can be dismantled in 48 hours which is this visitor center which was the opening image of the lecture so now when we come to institutional buildings, I want to share with you a recent library that we've done. And this is a campus designed by Doshi. So this is the first non-Doshi building there. And it's a school of architecture where I also studied. So it was really intimidating to be asked to design a library in the heart of the campus. Uh, and so we were given a site, Christopher Benninger, who's an American architect who settled in India, did the master plan. And this is the site they gave us, so we had very little choice. And the requirements needed a six-story building, which was very problematic for me because this, these are Doshi's buildings. This is a cafeteria and an eating facility we've just recently added. And we've also restored the entire plaza uh, so that you create a relationship between these buildings. And so to put a six-story building here, was difficult. Uh, this was a very complicated project because my patrons were, of course, the Ahmedabad Education Society, but the, but the operational clients were all architects and all people who had been senior to me in the School of Architecture. So it was a very difficult proposition, many consultations with students and faculty. And finally, we came up with this idea that we are not going to go a centimeter above Doshi's buildings, but instead we are going to bury three floors underground. And this was a difficult decision to make, but it was the only way that you could make it contextual. And for, that, for me, that was very important because this is a modernist historic precinct. Uh, uh, and very important as part of our own heritage, besides my own personal sort of heritage. And that's our first presentation where after teasing the committee for a while, I opened the side of the model and they realized, they kept saying, you can't fit all the requirements, it's impossible. We know, you know, I said, no, all the requirements fit and I teased them for 15 or 20 minutes just to soften the mode. And then I removed the side of the, the model and they saw three floors below uh, the, the ground and there was silence and then they could absorb it. And I, then I realized I'd won the battle and we went ahead and we designed the building, which is actually like these sort of Chinese or Japanese dolls where they nestle into each other. It's actually three buildings. The first building, which is the outer skin, which you see on the top there, is one which actually acts as a skin. It modulates the climate uh, of, the, of, the, of the building. Uh, the next layer in there is surfaces, which are now well protected because they are four meters, they're set in, so the rain doesn't get to them. But it's a skin that insulates areas that had to be air conditioned. Uh, all the building, the entire building is designed for air conditioning, but you don't need it in most parts. And then the inner building is a, a stack, is the book stacks, which is a completely different building that goes down three or four floors. Now, the interesting thing is that the sectional logic of each of these buildings is different. The outer building has a 4.5 meter uh, floor height. The next one has three. And then the third one has just 2.4 meters, eight feet, which is what you need to reach a book. And so sectionally, they don't actually align, which means you get beautiful slippages that allow you to see across the section on a diagonal which is critical to not feel claustrophobic when you've gone three floors uh, below the ground but also the uh, we've taken natural light all the way down so you don't feel the claustrophobia because you have natural light going down all the way to minus 12.4 meters uh, which is quite was quite ambitious so that's what the building looks like in section you see that's the stacks which has its own logic that's the reading rooms, which had its, it has, it's like another building. And then that's the outer skin, which is movable uh, louvers. Uh, and that's what it sort of looks like with the things. That's what it looks like completed. Uh, it's a concrete base, which has these deep niches, which were meant for students to sit and occupy it. So people eat there. They work on their laptops. So the base is always full of students that occupy. They're like little alcoves and reading niches. Uh, and the, the louvers, uh, each panel can be operated by one handle. It's all mechanical. Uh, and you can completely make it transparent or you can close it depending on you know where the sun is penetrating the building uh, and, and at what time. Uh, 
Uh, and that's how it sort of sits in context. This is the plaza that we've restored. And we've picked all our lines and our points and datums and reference points from Doshi's buildings. So it kind of respects that, but doesn't mimic it in terms of materials. It keeps the texture similar, but it begins to pick up all the datum for the proportions to inform the, the, the proportion. And this is the threshold you walk through where you see this large four meter space, which protects the building. It, it picks up on the same kind of brisole, but it does it spatially. Uh, in a completely uh, different way. And there are four bridges which come in from four directions, uh, inspired by the Fatehpur, Sikri, Tansen sort of uh, platform, uh, which allow you, and you see the depth of these niches where students can, uh, can uh, sit and, and, and read. And the ground space, the ground floor is a completely fluid space, which is meant for students. It's used for exhibitions, used for reviews, it's used for student meetings. It's a common space for the entire campus. So that through the function allows a complete fluidity at the ground level uh, between all the buildings. It's used for exhibitions more formally. It's lined up totally on access to Doshi's buildings. So it kind of respects and frames that old entrance of the existing architecture uh, school. Uh, and in the evenings, you begin to get these beautiful reflections. And as you go down into the building, you see the natural light. Uh, this is a courtyard, so that's the ground level. The concrete gets lighter as you go into the building, so that's a dark charcoal concrete, and it begins to get white as you go down. Uh, and the light penetrates through these skylights, and it comes all pouring all the way down, especially down to this level. And this is the archive, so there's very minimal uh, light there. Uh, and so this is at the minus four meters level. You see the skylights uh, that you see there. Uh, and then this is how you see the relationship between the inside and the outside. Carols sort of are uh, uh, along the perimeter and the stacks are sort of within. Uh, which have again like I said their own logic and you have a courtyard outside so if you want to step out to meet uh, and have discussions now they have tables and chairs there you don't disturb the rest of the library so within that lower courtyard you have a meeting space uh, for discussion and in the good weather you can actually have a seminar class there and, and all of that and then sectionally that's what so at any moment you actually see three or four levels simultaneously with natural light filtering down so you don't get stratified just because each each of those buildings have a different sectional logic. And so the porosity visually and on the diagonal, I think helps open the vistas and ex ex extends the perspective uh, and the space. And the lowermost area is quiet reading rooms. And then these are the stacks, which I said were eight feet with these sort of staircases that take you up these mezzanines. And so this is what sectionally it feels like. Uh, these are catwalks on which you can stand to, and there's a, 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 a arrangement for a harness. Uh, and uh, this is how you go through the section of the building. These are the bridges that sort of connect you across different parts of the campus. And these are the carols uh, and the skylight. Uh, the concrete, as you can see, has got much lighter. It becomes white as it goes down. And this is the lowest level where you see light pouring down. So this is already at minus 8 meters. Uh, and you see the book stacks within. Uh, these are the reading carols for the PhD students and you know students who need dedicated space. Uh, and those are the half levels between the, the, the book stacks. Uh, uh, as you go through kind of the building, and so this is the lowest level, and you know the the, the these are three of these are four portals that are the entire structure. So there are no columns. The portals really uh, support the building above, uh, and uh, all the electrical air conditioning is all integrated in the stack. So you don't have ducting. It's a very clean, pure, uh, concrete uh, space. Uh, you know, uh, with the with the reading rooms in it with sort of sections within it which for, uh, for more private sort of gathering. And as you go up to the upper levels, it's much lighter. Uh, there's more light. These are the reading rooms and spaces for magazines, journals, for people to work on their laptops. Uh, it's air conditioned. There are areas outside the air conditioning where now they have tables. These are conference spaces uh, which are very cool because they're well shielded from the sun. Uh, and uh, you know, and then the louvers can be adjusted at will. Uh, and one of the sort of aspirations of this building were, as I read it with the users and with the faculty, was how can one actually, you know, not do something in brick and concrete, which is beautiful, but not as relevant today, or much more difficult today, when you have an influx of many new materials. So how can the building actually demonstrate to the students the use of new materials like glass and plywood and gypsum board and stuff, 
but do it in a way that might also be performative. So the building was also meant to be instructional in its aspiration and the climatic aspects of it was one key uh, part because we forget climate. We were talking about form follows climate. And so this building is now used in the third, third year, first semester, I think, for their environment and climate class as a building they map through the semester. And so what we did was we produced a handbook in two languages which tell you how to operate the building, tell you what months, what temperatures, and now their students are mapping temperatures in different parts to understand how climatically by altering the way the louvers are set in the morning and the evening, it could actually become instructional. So it becomes a demonstration of that. Uh, and at night, of course, it all reverses because it becomes very transparent. You begin to get the surfaces silhouetting and you get these beautiful uh, reflections where you have the play between this raw concrete and the more kind of finished uh, interior uh, spaces. So from that to jump to Hyderabad, back again, where we started with the palace restoration. This is a corporate building and uh, you know I call a lot of the corporate and global architecture, I call it the architecture of impatient capital, where capital is intrinsically impatient. Uh, and these are buildings which uh, have to manifest the value of capital very quickly. Uh, that's why they are often vendor-driven buildings and architects now have to worry about going higher than each other or twisting the building more than e each other, but it's really the vendor who delivers the building for the client on time because time is of the essence. And terrains that actually create the least friction for, impatience, the, for the impatience of capital like Dubai, Shanghai, suddenly become celebrated. They're all autocracies that allow that to happen. So in a democracy, what does that mean? And of course, in places like Manhattan, where capital and land is such premium, this gets perpetuated and many other parts of the world get built in that image. And so here we were approached to do a corporate building for a state-of-the-art infrastructure company that was getting global investments. And they wanted exactly this. They wanted a glass box, essentially. And it was really difficult, but in this case, the patrons and the client were one entity. Of course, the users were different and almost non-consequential to the clients, but to us they were naturally very important. This was the site, it's outside Hyderabad in Cyberabad, which is a kind of very dry, hot climate really. Everything here is a glass box except that circular building which is Mario Botta, so it's clad in brick uh, and it's different, but the rest are essentially all glass boxes. And this is, like I said, a state-of-the-art kind of uh, infrastructure company. This is like a NASA room where they have every piece of equipment, that means all their trucks, their dumper trucks, tractors, anything of their equipments that are 500 kilometers away have cameras loaded on them and they in real time monitor who's doing how much work. If someone takes a, a, a loop break that's too long, he gets a call on his cell phone from this control room. So these guys are really into efficiency and stuff. So the kinds of buildings they showed me were these, like this is Mercedes-Benz showroom. You see the Benz sign at the bottom of the slide. And you know, Hyderabad was going through this political crisis where the state was going to be divided into Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. And these glass buildings were ideal buildings to stone by rioters, you know. Uh, don't throw stones at people, you know, if you live in a glass house. Uh, and, and so these were, what was amazing was they all had fishing nets on them. And I discovered that the curtain glazing manufacturers would actually give you a choice of fishing net colors because it came with the detail of the curtain glazing on how you can fix the fishing net so that if people threw stones at the building, you were safe. And it made me really think that, talk about impatient capital, talk about globalizations, the kind of compulse or the strength of these images of what is called global architecture in terms of its materiality and what it means to relate to that as a corporate building or investments from around the world is pathetic. And, you know, talk about architecture not being a movable feast and Hassan was sort of emphasizing how architecture is about the region and about place. This was really bizarre. And so at this time, we were in Jaipur doing some research, and I came across these beautiful thatch huts, which I discovered were water coolers, which a, a, a business community and the government collaboratively did. There were 200 of them, and they were set up in the summer in April when the temperature was about 45 degrees centigrade. How does that translate into Fahrenheit? 100 or something, really hot. You could fry an egg on the road. It was really hot. And these were water coolers which supplied safe drinking water, free of charge, without any plastic cups. People just cupped their hands, washed their hands, and drank water, sign of gratitude, and were on their way. 
we were touched by this gesture and we said asked ourselves how this could inspire our building because this was really relevant and this is just a footage from what that looks like so this is the hut that's the opening this guy works for the association in the morning at about 9 30 or 10 he comes to work and all he has the only valuable thing he has is a brass kettle which he puts out and he's open for work and people come cup their hands drink water it's safe clean very good water and people appreciate it a great deal and every once in a while he comes out and he humidifies the hut uh, and so that through evaporative cooling even the hut stays really cool and within the hut all the water is in earthen pots and that too through evaporative cooling keeps the water naturally cool it's called a matka which is classic and historically used to keep water true. and he assures you it's hygienic water what more do you need and such a beautiful gesture no plastic cups it's beautiful in the way people make eye contact thank you and move along and so this was deeply inspirational to us and we thought my god let's sort of see how does this translate into a building in hyderabad which is a similar hot and dry climate uh, and so we began to you know look at many things we looked at the quality of light through the thatch we looked at how you know it performed uh, and then we came up with a building which is a five floor high garden on all four facades now this is not a green wall like you put those plastic containers on stick them to the wall and make patterns out of it this is a performative screen which gets humidified through a misting system that's integrated in the trellis uh, and the hydroponic trays from which the plants grow so it's very efficient very little water to grow the plants and the misting can keep the plants damp and therefore they through that humidity and evaporative cooling the building keeps cool we applied the clients were of course very keen to get a lead certificate we failed on all the applications for the LEED certificate because our windows weren't sealed, our air conditioning wasn't efficient, but we didn't need that. And of course, later India changed to the Greer model, which is a model adapted for passive cooling and things. But when we were doing the building, you know, and finally we convinced the clients, they were very young people, that look, go this way, this is going to give you much more mileage in whatever you're trying to do. And so every facade is different. We experimented with depending on which direction of the sun, and we kind of made patterns, all the things that people do with Aleco Bond because they were showing us buildings where Aleco Bond did different things in colors. We said we can do that with plants. And so we came up with this sort of facade. We grew them in a nursery to experiment with them. Uh, we talk about impatient capital. They were in a hurry. They wanted the building in 18 months. We gave it to them. They got the cows to inaugurate it and did all the rituals and everything. And we said, give us one more year to grow the facade. And they agreed. And in this little shed outside the city with an old contractor who said that if you give me a year to do the thing, which means I, instead of buying five molds, which are very expensive, I'll buy one. And we'll use recycled aluminum and melt it down. Uh, we can take a year to do this, but that's when it'll be economical for us because otherwise investing in the molds would not give him the return and so we got the client to agree and we slowly built this trellis it was all handcrafted in this kind of new material in this little workshop uh, which was in a sense it felt very handmade just because of the process uh, it was uh, that's the one mold that we invested in uh, and the mold has a particular form uh, this is all the recycled aluminum biscuits which are that sort of different colors but it gave us a beautiful texture by default and it felt you know rich that is the trellis which has a piping which and they're very small components so two people can hand make them women are employed here uh, who help with the anodizing this is one of the largest anodizing tanks you've seen but you see how light it is and when enough accumulate they put it in a little truck a pickup truck and take 20 panels to the site uh, and two people can begin to uh, actually assemble it and then it gets assembled the plants grow and that's the kind of misting just when it had been done which keeps the building cool for atmosphere uh, and, 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 and any of that and so you know it becomes a woolly monster you give it a haircut you don't recognize it when you go back a year later it is kind of dynamic but it's organic uh, and that's the trellis which is also designed with the care that in case the plants didn't grow or you had to replace plants one year the building would not look bad it would look it glistens in different ways because the different textures uh, pick up light uh, the podium has all the parking and you have this building that sort of grows above it in plan two and in section it's designed in a way to extract hot air uh, 
the sandwich, the salami you see in the sandwich is the tendering department because the accounts needed the privacy. Uh, this is the corporate area, that's the auditorium, the gymnasium, the cafeteria. So it has an array of spaces, so it's a kind of world within this sort of envelope of green. It has a podium which has water bodies, meeting places, uh, you know, you see curiosity, young people looking at plants. Uh, so it has a sense of the public also and commons. And, you know, the species flourish. Sometimes they burn out in bits. You grow them. This is lemongrass. That's what the interiors look like. They extract air. Uh, and now, we, you know, that building you see on the top, like the walkie-talkie in London, they got a LEED certificate. They're right across the road from us. Uh, and, you know, this is deadly on the public sphere. Uh, and we couldn't get a LEED certificate because they met all the sealant requirements and the air conditioning efficiencies uh, and all of that. But now we are beginning to map it. We've done it sporadically. I must admit it's a really intuitive project in a sense we didn't sit down uh, you know scientifically to say what it might be we kind of went along and now we're trying to mine data from it to understand it the shadows become ornament and this is an important image which I like to talk about an intern from Panama City took it so this is not a photographer but this is again going back to the idea of the soft threshold in a corporation like this the 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 gardeners would be the lowest paid employees. They'd probably be on their haunches working in the garden as the CEO would drive by in an Audi with reflective glass, making no eye contact. But now the 20 gardeners in this building, as a friend of mine said, you've created true green jobs because the identity of the corporation and the building now depends on the poorest paid. But more than that, they're empowered in a funny way they can roam on these catwalks anywhere. They can look into anyone's office. Someone can be rude and pull the blinds down. That never happens. So they make eye contact with anyone they choose to make eye contact with. And you know, that woman wouldn't be wearing that sari to work if it was she was working on her haunches in the garden where no one noticed her. And so you begin to, and again, this wasn't something we consciously sat down to design, but you know, thinking and reflecting about it, one realizes that you create access. It's the same way as in our buildings in the US, and I don't know the solution for that. People come in in the night into our, and clean all the garbage and take the recycling stuff away. They're invisible in a sense. So here, again, you make visible through architecture uh, the unempowered, perhaps, you could argue. And so there's a great rapport between now the people and the 20 gardeners. If you go to their blogs, they talk about things like how they made friends with the gardener and now they prepare bouquets for them. If there's a celebration at home, they catch butterflies for their kids if they've got to study them in school. So there's a synergy that occurred. Again, I think by default, I don't take the credit consciously about that, but it's important to reflect about it. And so they become really the heroes of the building in a sense. And so again, this is not a staged image. If it was, I would have moved those wires in the newspaper. But you know, I just happened to walk into this guy's cabin and there the workers were right in the background, you know, right there. And they sometimes tap on the glass and say hello and move on. Uh, and so it's a nice sort of synergy between, like I said, you know, the, 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 the best, uh, 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 the highest paid and the lowest paid. And these are just, again, images of it. This is something we made recently for the Venice Biennale, and I went back. These are the old images, but we went back at the heat of summer, that was last uh, May, when we thought everything would burn out, and we did uh, some footage, and we found that actually the plants were really thriving. Uh, this is, of course, early footage. The new footage will come in a second. Uh, but we were surprised that, uh, you know, it had survived now over 10 years or 11 years. Uh, and, you know, you can set the misting depending on the atmosphere you want. The glass is where the conference rooms are, so they come out beyond the green. The top is all solar panels, so all the public spaces run on solar energy. And this was at the height of summer last year, uh, where the plants were really flourishing and bits they were burnt out because those were particular species that shed uh, in the summer. Uh, but overall, it was uh, in, in, in pretty good shape. And you can imagine when it's blooming how those different colors uh, would sort of uh, uh, would, would, would register. So this is again an example where this not only has an aesthetic dimension, I think by default it had a social kind of uh, uh, dimension, uh, but also it's performative in the way. And it was, we were lucky it sat next to a garden, which the government, it's a common garden, so visually it feels like it's actually growing out of the garden, although it's on the edge of the garden. So that kind of uh, uh, helped us a great deal. 
So what I've sort of show, shown you so far, I think I would say these are kind of uh, global programs, corporate offices, uh, library for a school of architecture. Uh, and the challenge is how do you localize them? How do you take what are global programs that float around the globe and in a sense they have expected images that are supposed to be instrumentalized to manifest them and how do you localize it? That's been the challenge in the few projects I've shown you. We've done many others where we've experimented with this idea. The converse of that would be how do you take very local programs uh, and you know I've only put one project we've done three or four including community toilets and many others uh, uh, institute for slum children which I don't have the time to show you but in a number of our projects the uh, the the question has been how do you take things that are very local very particular to a place and you almost expect uh, uh, a representation of those programs in in very localized ways of doing things, which often become a caricature of what you're trying to do. And these local programs actually in our globalized world should resonate globally. So how can you take those lessons, whether they're of sustainability, of questions like water and sanitation, and actually resonate them in ways that the world can learn from them in some ways in terms of their process. So there are a number of projects, but because I can't show you, I'm just showing you one. where. This was the most complicated project, that's why I'm showing it to you, where the patron in this case was the chief minister of the state of Rajasthan, who commissioned a competition, which we won. Uh, and then very quickly she went out of power. Uh, and then for 10 years she was out, or for seven years she was out of power. And we were struggling there because the operational clients were the public works department, the forest department, the secretary for zoos, you know, people who were total bureaucrats who had no access often to the chief minister or the new chief minister and had no care for the users in which in this case there were a hundred elephant and their mahouts. And the mahouts are all Muslim uh, because this is the history of the Mughals bringing elephants to a desert. The elephants shouldn't be here, they're in the tropics. They should be in Sri Lanka, Kerala, in India, where they thrive, they have enough water, they have you know coconut trees that they can break and scratch their backs with. Here there's not a stick in the ground, it's a desert climate. And so it's an accident of history that they are even there. Uh, and so the climate doesn't suit them at all. They've been celebrated as part of tourism. This is from the New York Times in the 60s, uh, where they became the icon for which you know, visitors went, the elephant and in India, the Maharaja, uh, and all of that. They take tourists up and down the ramparts of these forts. Uh, they get painted in these colors, which are toxic. There's no water, so they can't wash them. So their skins discolor, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, that's where the government had them live, which were, you know, they all were parked at the bottom and the Mahouts lived on top. Uh, and they were like cars in a garage. But the Mahouts all moved down. That's why you see the beds down there. And the Mahouts even moved out of here. This was housing the government provided, which didn't work, because the relationship between the mahout and the elephant is a very complex one. The elephant is can be a very gentle animal, but it also can be a beast. Uh, and you know, it, there have been cases at Amber where tourists have been killed, where these elephants have been uncomfortable and annoyed. And so the mahout builds a relationship with the elephant, they sing to the elephant, they caress the elephant, they have to be in close proximity, their children play with the elephants, so they become part of the family. And so as a housing type, this was a completely wrong solution, which didn't work, and that led to animal activists lobbying with the government to have this sort of new housing for them and the competition, etc. And that was a site we were given, which was, a, it, it was just sand. Uh, and so of course we began to study water requirements, how much elephants need, what we could aspire to, and we made it a landscape project around water. You know, the, for us, the architecture was inconsequential, and I think we won it because of that, because I know many of my other colleagues in the competition, perhaps rightly so, they kind of fetishized what were elephant stables. So they looked at historically how elephant stables were, and you know, the, the construction, etc. cetera. So they were like mega structures where 50 elephants at a time would live, and. But here, for us, the qu fundamental question was how do you create an armature for life? And water was essential for the life of these creatures and for their survival. And so we made water the primary kind of 
protagonist in this sort of project. This was a site. Studying it in Google image, uh, Images, we realized the path of the water and therefore came up with the scheme of creating micro dams where the water could be actually harnessed. And then in the interstitial spaces, we placed the housing units. We didn't uh, put the housing units uh, in the prime land, which would be used for the water. And so that was the site plan. It had you know components like we planned a visitor center. Now we've done one here, which I'll just show you. These were some abandoned buildings from a previous project. So we restored them to make a school for the kids of the Mahouts. And these are the housing units that have been spat. And this is a kind of entrance uh, zone. And that's how when we got the land in 2007, that was our first site visit. That's what it looked like. Uh, in three years, that's the same hill that you see here. That's how we managed to transform it. Uh, and then now, recently, we've, that's the same hill. Uh, it's a completely different landscape. And this was only because we managed the water rather than emphasizing the architecture. And of course, the Public Works Department and other agencies went ahead with the building because you know that's where the money is, in a sense. We didn't even have landscape in the tender items. But we managed to convince them to just plow soil out to be, and, and the government fell, so for three years the new government didn't want to have anything to do with the project. We were frustrated, we were about to walk out, but then later we realized that was to our benefit because it allowed the landscape to regenerate itself untouched because no one lived there. So when we made bridges to the new government who are now our patrons and they came to site with us, they said, wow, this is transformative and they got excited and began to help us incrementally uh, in the project. Of course, we also worked hard on the uh, housing and you know, these are 400 unit homes, uh, which is what the government allows for low income housing, because the Mahouts earn about 5,000 rupees, less than $100 a month. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's like really low income. But by aggregating the three houses, again, going back to the things we talked about, Korea's housing lessons, we created a cluster of three houses with a house for the elephant, uh, uh, and which is in very good proximity to the house. We added a courtyard so that that actually expands the house from 450 to 650, and then three people share courtyards, which we defined, which means implicitly we give them another 1,000 square feet each. So suddenly what is a 400 square foot house becomes a 2,000 square foot space, and if you aggregate the courtyard, it's a mansion. If the three families get along well, they're really in a mansion uh, because they can actually create their own privacy, etc., which is uh, what has happened. Uh, and you know, and then the principles of keeping it cool by creating structure for the thatch to be stored, so that way you get insulation, so you have food that is used every day, food that's left out to dry, uh, the grasses that gives the elephant a very comfortable kind of space, um, and. Uh, and again, I kind of always jokingly say this because you know elephants are of different sizes uh, and they can't sleep on flat ground. They need a berm, otherwise they can't get up. So that was uh, something we learned on the job. And this is the kind of mock-ups we had to do to figure out if the size of the elephant and the size of the room worked. And uh, we haven't done a monograph on our work yet. And I jokingly say, this is gonna be the cover image and it's gonna be called small, medium, large, and extra large. And so this is what it sort of looks like, uh, you know, when it's uh, when it was just complete. You see, begin to see fabric and people beginning to use that's the first water body. These are pavilions where they hang out together because they can't be. Elephants are very social; they can't be left for too long alone because they get kind of rogue. They got to go and meet buddies and hang out and spend time. So there's a whole kind of social engineering that kind of has to happen. And you see Amber Fort there, which is where they go to work. Uh, and you know, these are just how. You know, we had to keep the safety of the children in mind. So these are windows. They can caress the elephants, but the elephants are not endangered. I'm endangering the children's children's safety. Uh, and you know, you see the berm here. There's a someone coming home. That's his courtyard. Different people have done different things to their clusters. And this is what the extra water does because now they have more water than they need for the elephants. So they grow flowers, they sell flowers. In Jaipur, the middle class would die to have a lawn uh, in their houses, which they can't because they have to buy tankers of water just to keep their water supply going, leave alone their gardens. But here, the poorest in the community actually have more green than they need. And they all have the aspiration of the middle class, really, in the Indian context. And life corrodes architecture in housing, as I said, the trees are growing. They're 
now using the courtyards as their kitchen, which gives them more, one more room within which we, and the goats have arrived, the elephants and the goats hang out, the trees are up. Uh, you, you know, have clusters like this where people get on well, they have their own chicken, this guy's sort of looking for their dinner. Uh, and, uh, you know, so your kind of life begins. Now, you don't see the houses painted here yet because they weren't allocated. They've just been recently allocated. And in Rajasthan, there's a great, you know, uh, capacity for painting and decoration, which people will begin to do. That's a before and after. That's when we just built in 2010. And in eight years, that's the same hill again as a reference. That's the kind of transformation that has occurred in this essentially desert climate. And now the dish antennas have arrived, means life is thriving. Uh, and that's what the elephants sort of uh, do. They take tourists up there. Uh, and, and you know, one of the things again that happened by default, you see the discolored skin here. So the water bodies we put because we realized the elephants need water, we needed the green, we needed to create a micro environment. But we didn't realize that actually what we had done was create an amazing bonding between the elephants and the mahouts because the time that they really bond is when they bathe together because the, the mahout actually spends a lot of time bathing the elephant uh, and that becomes very sort of important for that kind of relationship and and that really was finally the most important aspect of bringing so much water you know to their availability uh, and that helped a lot uh, and so here you you know you see them frolicking and just look how peaceful that elephant is it's almost steady uh, while this guy sits and just sort of rubs and caresses them so suddenly they become so docile because this is of such comfort to them in a hot climate like the one here in the desert of Rajasthan. And now slowly the government gave us funds to embank it. We've been yet involved. These are all local species of what is called kikar, which is grown there. And these are the pavilions where uh, they have to uh, hang out. Uh, the reason I left this slide with this copyright is because I got this off the internet and when I went to TripAdvisor and some of these blogs, I realized it was really one of the most popular sites in Jaipur, which has the best historic buildings, but Hathi Gao Elephant Village was what, where everyone was hanging out. And the teenage kids of the Mahouts, who were now savvy with social media, actually started a company uh, uh, and it's like got a web presence. It's called Elephantastic and they wear t-shirts and they advertise this thing and European and American tourists who now go to Jaipur, they pay 100 rupees to feed the elephant so they can get that definitive image for their Instagram or for, for their Facebook uh, page. Uh, and uh, if you pay 500 rupees, they actually will get you to participate in bathing the elephants like they were. So it's become like really a hot tourist spot. So here you see them at play. That guy is one of the fellows who run it. So these guys now hang, not only do the elephants hang around together, but the young generation has actually turned it into an economy, which is quite brilliant, uh, you know, to think about it. So this was a recent mapping that I did. Uh, which uh, is interesting, what you see in color at the bottom, well, you see the days, uh, the years, and this is the BJP government in orange, and then they fall when we just start working. That's the Congress government, and then that's the BJP coming to power. These are the different actors. So this is the patron. These are all the operational clients. And depending on which government came and which secretary was appointed, the agency was in charge of the project change. So we were shifting agencies all the time. The only steady actor in this whole thing was our firm, which you see in red. Somewhere here, we lost interest because I wrote about 100 letters, some of which are here. And you can, if you read them, they're all letters of encouragement to the government. I have a file that thick. I wrote the chief minister every month to tell them why it was an important project. And then somewhere here, I get a call from the chief minister when we get re-engaged and she says, come and meet me on Monday. I've been wanting to do this project for political reasons. I didn't do it now. This is the last year of my chief ministership. The elections, are, this was in January. The elections are in December. We've got a year to finish the project. And that's what we did. In a year, we actually finished whatever we could of the project. And she lost the election a few months ago. So we were lucky we did it. So now the Congress party has come into power. Nothing will happen because just because the other government did this, not because they're not interested in the project. And we'll wait another two, three years and get re-engaged to finish more of it. And it was a very interesting mapping because it made me kind of really learn 
about what I'm sharing with you, the patrons, the clients, the users, and how this can be unpacked and put together, and who plays what role, and how you can be instrumental in creating these feedback loops. The only people we really stayed in touch with were the elephant keepers, and that helped us with the continuity in terms of our own presence on the site. And you know what really did the trick was, it's funny, the University of Ferrara in Italy, for some reason, two years ago, gave us, uh, or two, yeah, three years ago, gave us the gold medal for the most sustainable project that year for this project. And the president of the jury was Glenn Merkett, which was also like a real surprise. And so that certificate I sent to the chief minister, and that's when I got the call. Suddenly it legitimized something, uh, and, and that helped. But those are kind of the before and after. Now we are doing many more pavilions and water bodies uh, and trying to finish the project. Those will be trellises on which creepers will grow, so it will be even more green. Those are the pavilions where they'll hang out. We've now got the money to add water troughs, which we've did, which are very important. You can see the green. It's almost become virtually a forest in parts just because of retaining the water from what was just sandy desert. And that's a new gate we've done with a little interpretation room where there's an office where tourists can now buy a ticket to come in, so it gives them a little income. Uh, it's a many infrastructural components of the project that we're doing. We've now added a small guest room. Nandita was talking about Charles Correa's idea of the think tank for the chief minister. So this kind of inspired that a little bit. It's a courtyard with four rooms where uh, conservationists, people who are interested in ecology, can actually book a room and live there. And their lives are led out in the courtyard so they don't disturb the ecology of the elephants and the elephant keepers. So it's a very kind of low-key building with a veranda. And it kind of is in the same vocabulary as the houses of the mahouts and the elephants. Elephants, you enter it there. Uh, it's around a courtyard, very simply finished, uh, very basic materials. Uh, those are the wives of the elephant keepers, and that woman sitting at the end of the table is a secretary from the tourism department. She's training them on how to look after this little guest house, so that it provides them income. They cook and they clean, and they actually are the custodians of the guest house. So it also was a way of bringing them into that ecology, and that's the veranda finished in very simple materials. Now, these are the houses that got first uh, allocated. You can see many sticks in the ground. We planted 5,000 trees uh, in, the, in August, September last year. And what is interesting is when I went to site and I saw these birds painted on the houses, and I thought, you know, the Rajasthanis were going to paint animals and elephants and celebrate the elephants. So I kind of sat with them and asked them what they were about. They said, what you don't understand is the ecology of the place has changed because of the trees and the water. Now you have experts who come here to document birds and the amount of birds we have here, there are more people coming here to see the birds than to see the elephants. And one, you know, that was complete surprise and one was totally unexpected. But when I reflected on it, I realized that I think what we finally did was created an ecology, I think, uh, an armature to support life. And then what happens within that is often unpredictable like life. And this was one of the surprises uh, that the project kind of uh, threw up. Uh, and some of the parts of the site which are low-lying have actually become very thick. That's a Photoshop image, but that's how we are imagining it now, adding many more micro dams to create a wetness within the desert so it will really be like, uh, like an oasis. And then this is the area we've uh, renovated, the old buildings that had broken. It's become a school for the Mahouts children. We've used the same materials and vocabulary as we've used in the guest house and in the houses. So there's a consistency in the architecture, the disparity of function doesn't become evident. And now this next generation is, I think, uh, enjoying a kind of new armature for their you know, life. And so just in conclusion, I mean, I think, I think working in a place like South Asia offers many challenges, but also many frustrations. It makes vivid, very extreme conditions, uh, whether it's conditions of inequity and poverty, which is not to say that doesn't exist here, it does too, but it, in that extreme form, it's heightened. And I think the way we as architects across these geographies can address these issues, we can actually make the lessons cross over, rather than siloing them or making them specific to a geography. But the artifact of architecture itself is, I think, very specific to place, to climate, to material which is the kind of thing that we've tried to address uh, and also to address the question of very specific vocabularies which are very relevant for particular kinds of projects. Uh, you know, we often uh, 
you know, I mean, as architects too, we often get caught in this sort of rubric of consistency. We judge architecture by the evolution of that consistency uh, in terms of the aesthetic, but uh, I think every place demands a different response. So while you might sense a consistency in the approach that we've taken architecturally, even in its aesthetic vocabulary, etc., they're very disparate buildings, which are very much a response to a very particular situation. And so I think, the question of the sphere of our concerns and influence and how you make them in intersect, how the instrumentality and the agency of design can be resituated within the conversation and within society because society invests in us to imagine better spatial possibilities and how do we instrumental instrumentalize that aspiration and that uh, uh, expectation of society. I think puts us in a situation today within the academy and I'm sure we all deal with this of a series of crises and questions that we have to ask because the world has changed very fast and I think for the next generation, how do we reflect on this will become critical. And so this crisis is what I believe is occurring and this crisis is what I think we need to translate uh, into some kind of action because as they say, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm happy to. we've collected <laughs> yes you know the three big water bodies and uh, you know it's an interesting thing because you know when we dug these water bodies we wanted to line them <clears throat> because we felt that it's going to just percolate because you get a few inches of rain in Rajasthan you get these downpours and and the government said well that's not in the, it's not a tender item so forget about it so at that point we actually almost gave up on the project and then the old uh, Mahouts, the elder Mahouts, they told us that, look, don't worry about it, just do it, because it'll take one monsoon. This is a very particular kind of clay that if it's kept damp with even an inch of water, it'll harden as a membrane. And we did that, and that's how we collected water. But the truth is now that the elephants are using it so much, they are breaking that layer, and we are losing more and more water. Although the images I took of the Mahout, again, I had to document that for the Venice Biennale, so we shot that imagery in May, which is the peak of the summer, but there's enough water. Um, there's enough water for those elephants to line, uh, so which is not bad, but at some point they'll have to line it, to then the water will be all the way up to that retaining wall, which is what it used to be earlier. It used to be 10 feet deep earlier. Now it's gone down to 3 or 4 feet, but in the summer. Uh, Post-monsoon it rises to 5 or 6, but then through evaporation and uh, percolation it gets lost. So they'll have to deal with this. Uh, there's also an issue of which we didn't anticipate of contamination. So one water body is now, so for drinking they yet do bore wells because the quantity for drinking is very small, but for gardening, for the planting, for washing the elephants, for other uses, uh, they've now dedicated one water body and then one water body is just to bathe the elephants. So that water body is the one that's damaged the most in terms of the membrane, which was a natural membrane. If the elephants didn't bathe there, they'd have water overflowing. But uh, but you know, someone will be exhausted with this project. Someone will have to deal with it. I'm just interested if uh, there are any lessons that you took from this project uh, that you've been able to apply to other more urban projects. It seems like in, in many cases, like in urban design or planning, you you kind of do a project and then you away and you, you don't have the chance to kind of continue to kind of nurture it in, in, in the way that you did over this time period. Um, and then the kind of subtle changes that you made uh, that had this enormous impact. Um, I was wondering if there are lessons there for kind of thinking about urban, urban design. Yeah, you know, and I think, uh, I mean, that's not an easy question and one is in the process of thinking about this. And uh, the two projects are linked in, in the context, and I'm, luckily they were both shown here, was the, the, you know, the, the Fort District, the historic preservation project, and this one. 
And this one, you know, we are yet reflecting on it. We don't know how it will go. We don't know what this next cycle of a new government will do. And that's why we were trying to map all that and learning from that also. Actually, it's that mapping that helped me deconstruct or unpack the client and present it as the patron and things. I realized it from this project that these were three streams that hadn't connected and we were the ones who were connecting them in some way. I would say this, the one word answer to that would be purpose. So which is to say here, water was the purpose till we made that the central drumbeat. I think we managed to rally a lot of support. As the project started getting finished, there was, oh, let's have a ticketing booth so we can get some income from the tourists. Let's do this, let's do that. And then all these questions, Hassan, your question, and I kept telling them we need lining to save the water, we need to do this. That just didn't become a priority any longer because now it seemed that this had given rise to many other aspirations which they could. So how one makes that balance is important. And the same thing happened with the historic district, especially the art district. You know, till at least the time I was involved for about five or six or seven years, the purpose was singular that we're going to use this as an instrument to bring awareness to the area, but also use it as a way to leverage finances to physically improve the area. The current group that's sort of working on it, it's been my open public criticism, so I'm happy to even share it here, is they've lost sight of that. It's become so popular. Thousands of people come from around the city for it. I was there recently. It was I mean, it was almost pathetic that it had come down to that level because the number of people were out of scale with the area, the precinct, what it could offer, the number of galleries. It showed actually a desperation uh, for the need of public space in Mumbai, which is, you know, a discussion in itself, etc. And I was saying to the committee that now runs it, you've lost purpose of the fact that this was meant to instrumentalize the improvement of the built environment. And they're doing nothing about that. Money is just going into corpuses and becoming bigger, which means they can get more expensive artists to come and perform there, which means they attract more people, which means they run down the area even more. So, you know, planners use the word carrying capacity. This is a more complicated kind of interpretation of that. So I think I, what I've learned is purpose, especially on large scale projects, which are urban, where constituencies are disparate, where this idea of the client gets really complex and contested, uh, that purpose. And I think our role in defining that purpose and keeping people on track on that purpose becomes really critical. You know? And I think in cities, that's also a lesson that I would I think would resonate. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could talk for hours on this, but, uh, but I mean, just a short answer, just to fill you in more specifically to your sub questions. I mean, I think Mumbai has grown. I think one of the problems with urbanization in places like India with large populations is, you know, the better you make Mumbai, the worse it will get because the, when you have inequity, that's a problem. I mean, that's true in the United States. Why are cities getting bigger? Why are people going to the coast because you don't have enough happening, you know, in the Midwest or in some parts of the Midwest, etc. cetera. Um, so, I mean, I think finally we've got to zoom out at national, perhaps even global levels. Inequity is what is creating the imbalances, whether you talk about the refugees, where, you know, finally it comes to inequity. This has become acute on the planet, right? So I think that pans down to explain a lot about Mumbai, and that's why in 1964, when Charles Correa and others were planning and projecting New Bombay, it was about diversifying into other modes, opening up more affordable land, using transportation mobility instrumentally. So he argued that, in fact, mobility and transportation, which is a huge issue in this country, is the best form of indirect subsidy to housing. And you see, often governments subsidize housing directly, but if they don't have an interrelationship to jobs, that housing means nothing. It lies abandoned. And so how do you make these connections? That's why urbanization and housing become critical, in which mobility is a key component to receive subsidies, not housing so much. Because housing can be self-made, built. People can incrementally apply sweat equity and all those good things that John Turner and others spoke about. Right. So. Sorry? If you 
you suggested that on the panel. That's so correct. So, so correct. So, so, so that is, I think, at a meta level, the problems of Mumbai. Uh, at uh, then, there, there, then there, I think many scales. There is a dysfunctionalism there in terms of governance, and there's a structural problem in Mumbai, which is that the chief minister of the state of Maharashtra, who essentially runs Mumbai, is not elected from Mumbai. He could be elected from a little village in Maharashtra, which means Mumbai becomes his golden goose, essentially. And that's how you have corruption, and so the money goes in the wrong way. So there's a whole lot of systemic problems such as those. Then I think at an other level, which is what my writings on the kinetic city and on ephemeral urbanism and all have to do with, is I, I argue that in many cultures, and especially in the case of India, uh, architecture has been too central uh, in the conversation about cities. Cities are imagined through its architecture. And so again, sorry to use the word instrumental again, architecture is not the only instrument or the, the only spectacle by which a city can be defined and made. Uh, and so I believe that in places like a lot of South Asia and maybe many parts of Asia, the ephemeral needs much more, uh, it needs to be embedded much more in the conversation about city making. So it's not only the static city, uh, but it's also uh, landscapes that can change. And that's what my writing called the kinetic city is about, where I argue that the city, uh, that that Mumbai or cities in India should be not about grand vision, but about grand adjustments of how the city can kind of adjust. And and this, I kind of was inspired really as a student by J.B. Jackson, who wrote a, wrote a wonderful piece in a magazine, I forget the reference now, uh, which was called The Third Landscape. And he talked about how human beings in their first iteration were nomadic as we kind of existed and formed communities. Uh, and then as we became settlers, essentially cities became uh, ways of dealing with the surplus of the countryside, could be a simple explanation, and cities became important. And as wealth accumulated in cities, uh, architecture, the city beautiful stability, was the mode by which we settled. Uh, and that actually created all forms of inequity because the rich zoned themselves, or in Vienna, a great example, even music was interior. Uh, people, you know, zoning came from it. I mean, of course, in the German case, through uh, for responses to industrialization. But anyway, when the static city became a thing, it actually created separation. It became hard thresholds for different parts of society, and you began to exaggerate segregation. And that's, I, I'm paraphrasing, J.B. Jackson said it much more poetically. But then he argued what he meant by the third landscape was, he said, he gave the example of the farmer's market as ephemeral events, uh, or the circus that comes to town. And even if momentarily it suspends reality in a funny way. So the farmer's market, uh, it, 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 it changes the way people actually relate to each other. It animates public space and creates new relationships. In a circus, people went and they, across the ring, children from different economic and ethnic backgrounds became aware of each other. You saw an array of adjacencies colliding between acrobats and tigers and lions, and suddenly your imagination was fueled, but it was about human contact in that space, which is what he argued about. And he's felt, he argued essentially, as I understood it as a student then, was that as we've made the city more static and created more segregation, we need these temporary events that will begin to make connections and human contact again, correct? And so that, you see, in planning, one of the biggest voids in planning is we don't know how to deal with time. Uh, the notion of time, there's no language. We have scenario planning and we have phasing, which is, which is not time. Phasing is about yet an end state and an end imagination and just ways of monetizing it in ways that you can achieve it. But it's not about changing paths. Scenario planning does a little bit of that. But time in its imagination of how even within land dunes and zoning, things are a 24-hour zone. And how do you manipulate that? And you know, a lot of that pop-up stuff that's happening now, I believe is happening because there is a real need for it. Uh, you know, I always say this story about when we first came to teach in Ann Arbor, our kids, the school took them to a farmer's market and they were only five or six years old and they came back running and saying, we've got to go to the next farmer's market, it's beautiful. 
I said, gosh, you guys have forgotten where we've come from. The whole city is like the farmer's market, you know. <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, I think these things oscillate. And in Mumbai, we want malls and we want more organized shopping. And here I'm seeing like everywhere there are pop-up things happening all the way because people want to do things more spontaneously. So we'll somehow as a society on this planet settle somewhere in between at some point. I don't know if that's sort of uh, in, in a kind of like convoluted way, but yes. Not at all. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.